That song prepares us for the <coughs> reading of Genesis chapter 15. And I'll just tell you right off the bat, we will not finish Genesis 15, but we will read it together because it's one wonderful word. Genesis 15, after this, the word of our Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can, I, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer the Damath of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? And so the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite of each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. <coughs> when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. <coughs> On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Last week we meditated on the 14th chapter where God rescues a lot who had moved into the city of Sodom and God saw to it that Lot would be captured by the four powerful kings God saw to it that all of Sodom and Gomorrah and five other, three other kings that live in that area would be carried away because God is sovereign over all kings, all nations, all people, all history, all molecules. Everything is under God's sovereign care. Abram, 300 and 318 men rescued five kings from four kings. What five kings could not accomplish, 
God, God's word does. And not only is Lot rescued, I want you to never forget every sodomite was rescued and returned. I have grace on who I will have grace. I have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not depend on man. It depends on God. Now, that's a pretty good sermon right there. <laughs> we have. Now, God saying to Abram in chapter 15, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, and God says, do not be afraid, Abram. My first question for you is this, what would Abram be afraid of? He has just rescued. These five kings wrestled them from the hands of the most powerful kings way up there in the land of Ur, where the Tower of Babel was. <clears throat> Abram is a man of flesh, blood, dust. Abram knows there is revenge. Abram knows these four kings are not dead. These four kings are alive. These four kings have armies. These four kings are powerful. And the word of the Lord comes to Abram and says, don't be afraid. And God speaks those words in the same way what word shall I use? In the same <coughs> context as God speaks through Christ, the Son, in the New Testament, where Jesus says to the lame, to the lepers, to whatever, be healed. Be healed doesn't mean Okay, go to work, take medicine, do your therapy, find a doctor, and get yourself healed. It is something far more powerful. It is God's word healing. It's always amazing me that time when uh, they put that uh, crippled man down through the ceiling in front of Jesus. And Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. Never walked before. Because it's a command. Same context when Jesus says, be holy. That's not Jesus saying, get to work on your self-righteousness. Shape up and fly right. Be holy is a declaration, is a command. This is your situation. You are holy. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The evidence that you and I are holy is going to be seen in our daily living. But we are not holy because we are pious people. We are holy only because God declares holy. Here, God is saying the same thing to Abram. He doesn't say, Abram, no, pick yourself up now. Be brave, man. Do your thing. God is saying to Abram, don't be afraid because he says, I am your sheep. 
A shield. You all know what a shield was used for. God, your shield. Could you tell me what that means to you? God is your shield. Because God has covenant with Abram, and I'm going to say whatever is Abram, Abram, by the way, applies to every believer. God has made covenant with you. That covenant is expressed the first time in Genesis chapter 12, 2 and 3, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all peoples of the earth will be blessed. That's the covenant. That's the shield. Abram, no king is going to touch you without my will. Nothing will befall you without my will. I'm your protector. I'm your God. That's why we sang, I am the Lord your God. You are my people. That's all about God being your shield, the shield of your children, the shield of your grandchildren, the shield of your great-grandchildren, all the way through the generations. Isn't that beautiful? I think that is one God's sovereignty. By the way, if God is not sovereign, none of the promises of God are worth a nickel. God's sovereignty. That's how he reveals himself, beginning in Genesis chapter 1. All creation under God's sovereign authority. You and I live totally under God's sovereign will, control, and I'll just throw this in for information. Even all of your and my sins are in that sovereign will of God. I didn't say God made you sin. I didn't say that. I am only saved. They work to the glory of God. I am your, your very great reward. How in the world is God Abram's reward, your reward. How do you see that? Abram took no reward from Sodom, from the king of Sodom. Remember that last week? King of Sodom comes to him and says, hey man, you know, just let the people go home. You can have all these things. They're all yours. And Abram recognizing the king of Sodom as the seed of the serpent and having Melchizedek, the seed of the woman, he says to the king of Sodom, I want nothing from you, not a thread, not a thong from a sandal. I don't want you to ever say I made Abram rich. I belong to God. Go home. King of Sodom, God is my God. God is your reward. <coughs> In this sense, God is for you. And let me get that clear. <laughs> He's for you in the sense that he knows your future. He knows you are his lamb, his sheep. He knows you will inherit. That's not a will. You have it. That you have inherited 
eternal life. And so all things in your and my life are all working for our salvation. We say that when we recite uh, Heidelberg Catechism question and answer one. What is my only comfort in life and death? And in there we say that all things must work for my salvation. Now, just think. Don't say a word. Can you go back in your life? Is there anything in your life that did not work for your salvation? Anything? You wouldn't admit it out loud, I know that. <laughs> but, if you think there is, let's have coffee together, okay? Because all things, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for my salvation, and I can point, you can point and say, there's the marker, there's the marker, there's the marker, there's the marker. I am the man, I am the woman, I am the young boy, girl I am today, only because the Lord is for me. He's not against you. What a privilege. And so, the first point, or the second point of the sermon here, if you follow the outline, is from Ephesians 1, 3. This first verse of Genesis 15 and Ephesians 1, 3 say the very same thing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. God says in Isaiah 46, I am God, there's no other. My purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. That's the God you wake up with every morning. Well, you slept with him all night. By the way, he's the God who is with you all day. He's the God who is for you. Now, verse 2. But, don't you like that word? Problem. I know that, Abram says. But, O oh sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? One of the curses is childlessness. Now tell that to our modern culture that aborts children, that adopts poodles more than they adopt children. Talk to these orphans over here in Cambodia. Children are a reward from God. I'm quoting Psalm 127. Abram understands some things that I believe our culture has lost. Being a father is the highest privilege in the world. Abram says, Sovereign Lord, Sovereign, you've controlled my life. You, Sovereign Lord, have not given me a child. And we say in the vernacular, I'm sure Abram and Sarah try. 
But Sarah is a barren woman. And Abram is saying, by the way, Abram here now is about 10 years of following Christ. 10 years. You gave me the covenant 10 years ago. I'm going to make you into a great nation 10 years ago. I'm getting older. I'm getting drier. It isn't working. And who will inherit my estates? <coughs> you young boys from Cedar. When you think of the word inheritance, what comes to your mind? Anybody? In our minds, inheritance is this piece of paper. Dad made it, dad and mom made it, made it. Sat down with a lawyer, and this is what happens to the farms, and this is what happens to the houses, and this is what happens to the bank account, and this is what happens to all my stuff. And so when you look at the word inheritance in this passage, it's easy to say, aha, he's talking about all of his, his livestock and his servants and all of his tents. He's a very rich man. And that's true. I think one of the most difficult things that we do as adults is make out a will. Solomon struggled with it. He says, you know, who am I going to give my property to? I work for all of this stuff, and I'm going to give it to somebody that never worked for it, who's not as wise as I am. Big problem, isn't it? And so Abraham says, I assume, God, that you want this to go to Eliezer. And Eliezer seems to have been the man who was the head servant, managed all of uh, Abram's farming and herds and servants and all of that stuff. But I want you to think deeper. There is something far more valuable that is not written in your will. That your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren should inherit. And that's what Abram's talking about. It's this thing, the most valuable thing you have in your life. It's faith. It's the knowledge of God. It is what you have been taught. God is sovereign. God is Lord. God is the main character in your life. Paul had that problem. Saint Paul. I believe Paul was a single man. God brought into Paul's life a young man which, who was old enough to be his grandson. His name is Timothy. Timothy had a Greek dad, which we don't know anything about other than he was Greek. But he had a mother and a grandmother. And I never can remember whether it was Lois or Eunice. Anybody know? Who was his mom? But Paul says to Timothy, the faith that lived in your mother I say Lois, could be wrong, and your grandmother Eunice. 
I've taught Eunice's and I've taught Lois's because those are names that we, we treasure. Wow. The book of 1 Timothy and the book of 2 Timothy are Paul's giving of his inheritance of faith to Timothy. Because Paul is in prison. Paul knows his days are almost finished. He's not retiring, Larry. He's going to die. Who is going to preach the gospel? Who's going to be the light in the world? Who's going to comfort God's people? Who's going to be God's instrument in building the church? Paul saw it as Timothy, and Timothy responds by the Holy Spirit living in Timothy, and Timothy, by the grace of God, is a tremendous son to the Apostle Paul. That's what Abram is talking about. God, you have given me faith. You have given me your knowledge of you. You have revealed yourself to me. I am to be a blessing to all nations. You're sovereign. That would mean I must have a child to train and teach and walk in the ways of the Lord. That's what Abram saw the first duty of a father to be, and there's no perfect father, I know that. Hold that up to you. I'm not leaving you moms out, okay? <laughs> Mom and Dad, you're together. Look at Eunice and look at Lois. They were so influential in the life of Timothy. And what God had done through Lois and Eunice, Paul really feeds and nourishes more. But Abram says to God, you're my sheep. I mean, God says to him, I'm your shield, I'm your reward. And, and, and Abraham says, okay, who am I to give faith? Well, we don't give faith, but who do we instruct? Who are you going to bring into my life, God, that becomes a pillar? The truth that you live in, who loves you and knows you. And I see that clock. This is, this is where we're going to have to stop. But are you fed? Challenged? Then beautiful? Because when you look at your own life, who were those who gave you that inheritance? You say, well, it's God. We have parents, sometimes there's other people in our lives, and sometimes the people who were our instructors fall away from the faith. But God, to Abraham, he had no godly mom or dad either. God took hold of him and changed him. And that is what Abram is saying. How do I carry on your work? Because from generation to generation, that's how the church remains the light in the world. I'm going to say amen there, and we will pick that up next week at verse 4. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word, so rich, so full, so powerful, so instructive. And we reminded of our duty as parents. 
And we know you're imperfect. But you take the imperfect and you work in the lives of our children and our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all of those whom you have called, you justify and you glorify. May you be glorified, Father, through our lives, through our teaching. In the name of Christ, amen.